folks, we're back. This is Steve Sands, Jim Jonas, and Steve Jonas as a special guest um, for Veterans in Politics. Today we have legendary icon, former county commissioner, Bruce Woodbury. But before we get to the county commissioner, we're going to talk to Jim. So, you got anything? Um, no, actually, I really don't, don't have too much. I think it's... Uh, really? I think it's well. You know, I state would, capitals being invaded. You but, don't have nothing going on. But you know how I say that, though, Steve. This is ironic, and so I want to apologize to the viewers because every time you ask me that question, they go, "Oh no, not really that much." And then twenty-five minutes later, I'm like, "All right, let's get to the guest then." <laughs> so I always have something to say. So just, uh, just for civics purposes. Right. Or, you know, civic, social studies, <laughs> however they redefine it now. Uh, January 6th is actually the date that uh, we, as a country, will certify uh, the Electoral College. They did that. Yeah, and, <laughs> there's a, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, well, here's the deal. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing because... For historians out there, and I can only speak for myself for as far as my age goes, I remember when, uh, well, I don't remember, I wasn't born yet, but Richard Nixon had to certify because he was the vice president, and he had to certify the election for Kennedy, and now Mike Pence has to certify the election for Joe Biden. And there's a lot of rift and stuff that goes into that. But, uh, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, whether you supported Trump or you're a Biden supporter, the great thing about this country is we will survive. I mean, and I'm not going to talk bad about former president Gerald Ford, but Gerald Ford was only president for maybe a year, year and a half. He was kind of a filler. But the way I always look at it is this. If you can survive Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Jimmy Carter, all pretty much in succession. Don't forget the assassination of JFK. Right, well, I'm, I'm predating that, but we'll survive. Everybody just needs to calm down. Uh, there's a reason why our founders set the country the way they did. And I, I, I just hope everybody keeps their wits about them a little bit. Well, I always say when, when, when you're facing tragedy or, or something like that and you're facing disappointment, when one door closes, several yeah. doors open. So, And a good example of that, and just to uh, piggyback on that a little bit, Steve, it, um, you know, with the uh, election between Nixon and Kennedy, there, a lot of Nixon's attorneys said, hey, something isn't right here in Cook County. Like, for whatever reason, there's more people casting votes than there are actual eligible voters. You, you have a really good, um, yeah. you know, you have a good leg to stand on if you want to fight this election. And Richard Nixon said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't think the country will survive it. He conceded to um, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what? And then years later, he became president. Well, Donald, he, was, he was saw as a patriot for doing well, that. Donald Trump said he's not conceding. So. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> There's a shock. <laughs> and now, don't get me wrong, I, I think... But did uh, you see how many people that was there? Yeah. Thousands and thousands mm -hmm. and thousands. I mean, it was like a sea yeah. well, of folks, so... The the people people love them. the way it works. People love them, so... And that's the... And unfortunately, and I'll just leave it at that, unfortunately, we are at a very sad point in, in our country that it, we are so super divided that like neither side wants to listen to, to the other anymore. Like you're either 100% for Trump or you're 100% against him. Well, you're 100% Republican or you're 100% Democrat. That's very unfortunate. Well, like George Bush said, you either with us or you're against us. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, 
I will just leave it at this. I very much respected George H.W. Bush. Um, I think George W. Bush was a very good man. I think he listened to some stupid people. And yes, I said that. I think Vice President Cheney, I'm just going to be honest with you. I think he was kind of a piece of crap, to be honest with you. But anyway, we need to move on. We have a that's, very that's important That's the good thing guess. about this show. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Yes. <laughs> we have a very important guest on, and I got a lot of questions I want to ask him. So, well, How about you there, Steve? Uh, my thing is uh, I'm frustrated on social media seeing that people weren't speaking out against the other rioting and looting and stuff going on there like because they were they believed in why they were doing it and it was okay but now that they don't now it's not okay so i live in a hypocritical society what could i say very (laughs) so it it just frustrates me the lack of principle in that it's like you're either the principle of doing that to get your voice heard you know you're either for it or against it so I, i I don't appreciate that. I'm against any side doing it. I don't think it solves anything. I think it only causes more problems. Yeah. Um, as far as like what Jim was talking about with us being uh, divided, my two cents on that is, again, social media. So I was talking with someone earlier this morning, my Facebook feed. I have a lot of left-leaning friends. I have a lot of libertarian, I, everything across, across the political spectrum, right? right. Well, unfortunately, I'm not going to, well, not unfortunately, but I'm not going to sit there and keep liking someone's post when I don't agree with their point of view. I want to know what their point of view is. I'd like to talk to that person, but I'm not going to respond, right? So my Facebook feed gets, like, very small. So the way Facebook is doing that frustrates me because instead of just everyone's thing coming up so I can see some different points of views every once in a while, I only see points of view I agree with. So I think that's creating a bubble that people are only interacting with like-minded people and unfortunately we I think most people understand how that's not a good thing yeah. well diversity is always good yeah and challenging like so if you if you stand for something you got to be challenged right you know so that way you can back it up you become you know your ideology or even theology if you're questioned and you have to back it up and like not necessarily just always defend it but you know right. you just learn more and it so it creates wisdom. Yeah. You know, everyone's thinking everyone's so smart now. It's like intelligence wise or whatever. Yeah, people are, but we're losing wisdom because these bubbles that we've created. So, Commissioner Woodbury, Hello. sir, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Could you tell us about yourself? <laughs> well, let's see. I'm 76 years old. How much of that do you want to know about? Oh, uh, oh that's, that's, that's a lot of years. But you still look good, though. It's not possible that it's gone by that fast. But could, could, could you, like, condense a little? Okay. <laughs> well, I actually was born in Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay. Um, when this was a pretty small town. What, what, you and five other folks? Yeah. <laughs> and I met my wife in kindergarten. Oh, get out of town. And my two main law partners in kindergarten, well, actually before. We grew Who, up who are in your law partners, by the way? Gardner Jolly and uh, Bill Erga. Okay, okay. Jolly, Erga, Woodbury, and Holthus is the name of the law firm. Okay. And we're good lawyers, if you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, so, kind of, what, kind of, what kind of case do you um, take in? Well, the firm takes overall pretty much everything. Um, First Amendment, anti-slap, well, criminal defense. Not too much of that. I used to do a lot of criminal defense when I first started out, mm-hmm. mainly to get the experience. I would right. take appointments of uh, indigent defendants where there was a conflict of interest with the public defender. Mm-hmm even took a capital murder case and up to the Nevada Supreme Court, got the conviction reversed and then an acquittal on on retrial. Uh, That would be an interesting story to tell you about at some point, Um, that case and what happened after that. But uh, yeah, I do a lot of estate planning and probate these days. Okay. Personal injury, general business law. Okay. And... uh, 
the, the firm does a lot of commercial litigation on both sides. Yeah. And you were doing that while you were still county commissioner. <laughs> yeah, while well, I was a Clark County commissioner for 28 years. That's a long time. Which is far longer than any rational person that, would do. How did you get that highway named after you? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> just, just lasted a long time, I think. And yeah. Well, I was the... Um, I made public works, especially transportation and flood control. My, you know, some of my main goals became chairman of the regional transportation. I, I, I just want to say something, yeah, folks. This is the face of the two fifteen freeway. It's called the Bruce Woodbury Freeway. Actually, this is the face of it. That would help. I don't know. Well, if you uh, <laughs> you want a free pass to speed, you know, <laughs> see me. I, I say. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you speed on the 215 freeway, go see Commissioner Bruce Woodbury, and he'll take care of your ticket. <laughs> for a small fee. Um, <laughs> for 215. <laughs> I've never been cited yet on the 215, but I'm sure that day might come. Uh, could you imagine if you got pulled over and get a ticket on the 215-year-old <laughs> freeway? That would be funny. <laughs> that would be kind of fun, but... Um, Used to be uh, almost always if I get pulled over, they'd check my license, my registration, go back to the police car, come back and say, All right, Commissioner, just, you know, I'm giving you a warning. <laughs> don't do it again. Um, and they still do that to some extent, but not that I get pulled over all the time. Right. Just some of the times. But I do sometimes. Yeah. So, Commissioner, the one card. Hey. Oh, 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 oh. No, Is, okay. you done with yeah. your bio? He's not done with his bio, Jim. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we can go on for a while. Bio's boring, you know, but. Uh, and you, you have, how many kids you have? Well, I have seven children. I have 24 grandchildren. Jesus. I think one on the way. Oh, congrats. Five greats with one on the way. And one, one, one of your children was the mayor of Boulder City, um, Rod. My oldest son, Rod Woodbury, was the mayor of Boulder City after being a city councilman. Mm -hmm. He has seven of those children, and his children each have, well, they have, I think all of my great-grandchildren are wow. through his line. Wow. I have uh, other people followed me in politics. I didn't encourage them, but my daughter, Melissa, was... Uh, Melissa Woodbury was a state assemblywoman. Mm -hmm. My son-in-law, Glenn Levitt, is now a state assemblyman. Right. My son-in-law. Your son-in-law, Glenn Levitt. Kenny Taylor is the... Glenn, uh, Glenn, Glenn, blah, 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 blah. Glenn Levitt is your son-in-law. Yeah. Okay. State assemblyman. Who, 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 who is the son of former councilwoman uh, Peggy Levitt? Yes. Okay. Who, whose husband, uh, Charlie, tragically just passed away last week. Oh, wow. My condolence. Yeah, very good, very nice man. Very oh, good. I didn't even know that. I'm going to have to give her a call. Yeah. Uh, complications of COVID. Okay. Though he had pre-existing problems. Right. You're healthy as a horse, though, right? Seventy-eight years old. You, you're healthy as a horse. How long mm -hmm. have I known you? Nineteen. I think it was nineteen ninety. Yeah. Eight. It was that fire station at the end of the cul-de-sac. Remember how we first met? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you all look alike, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I became a commissioner in 1981, and uh, I do remember. And mm -hmm. then we carried on a relationship yes. off and on since yes, then. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I've seen you many times in that county commission seat. I have far too many that I, I could remember. But you've always done a great job. Well, thank and you, you, very you, much. you 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 lasted the G Sting operation. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one. He was only the last man standing. <laughs> I commend you for yeah. that, by the way. <laughs> well, I served 28 years with 27 different commissioners, mm -hmm. and only seven of them were convicted of major crimes. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a. It's called the uh, Yobo scandal. Like a year after I became a commissioner, uh -huh. commissioners Jack Petiti and Woodrow Wilson were convicted with some senators Floyd Lamb, yeah, uh, you know, an FBI undercover guy. And then more recently, it was the 
Lance Lee Malone. Sting. Was it Lance Malone, Mary Kincaid yeah. Chauncey, Aaron Kenny, um, um, Dar uh, Dario uh, Herrera. Yeah. yeah. And uh, did I did I miss one? And then later on, um, Commissioner Woman, it was, oh, Lynette. Lynette Boggs was McDonald, that was a different, was a different thing. Yeah. That, that was, um, I believe that was um, um, living in the district yeah. or something like that. Election yeah. violations. So. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And then, then there was um, um, Atkinson Gates or something. She was she retired. Or it was something dealing with the UMC um, scandal. The president of UMC she took out from Chicago or something, and blah uh, blah she blah. She was blah. never indicted, and uh, the CEO of UMC was, but then the charges yes, yes, dropped at some point. Yes, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. Oh no, no, you're, you're fine. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, Commissioner, I didn't mean to interrupt. It just yeah. like. When I when I get somebody when I get somebody on the show like you, I I, I get excited. I got all these questions. Um, well, I mean, the first question I have is actually a pretty pretty softball question. Um, so you were on the county commission for a number of years. Um, like, what what do you see differently in the county commission now than when when you sat on the county commission? Because like for me personally, like. I'm a political guy, so like all I see is okay. We got a group of Democrats up there, and they all just kind of go along, and that's it. Well, when I um, be, I'm I'm a Republican. I've always been a Republican. Um, Why? <laughs> because my parents were, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I grew up that way, and uh, in fact, I had a schoolmate elementary school on up. His name was Paul Bryan. He was the younger brother of Richard Bryan. And we used to argue politics. He's a Democrat. And we're we didn't know what we were talking about, but we, you know, when we were eight years old. But uh, we had fun. And I remember listening to the political conventions on the radio, because we didn't have TV in like 1952. I was always kind of addicted to politics and sports. But uh, when I became a commissioner, my district was pretty strongly Democrat by party registration. Yeah. But uh, local government wasn't considered partisan in those days. Yeah, right. Uh, throughout my 28 year career, I was the only Republican a lot of that time. There were two of us for a while, and at one point there were three of us. Um, um, Lorraine Hunt, who became yes. lieutenant governor, lieutenant governor. Right. Yeah. and uh, Chip Maxfield and myself. Were you the last Republican and to sit on that Republican. seat, by the way? Chip Maxfield and I uh, stepped down He's got it over. in... Uh, Am I taking calls? Yeah, so in 2009, Chip Maxfield and I stepped down. We were the last Republicans, and it's been strictly Democrats since then. But during those 28 years, I've elected chairman. He a stepped few down times. for um, family reasons, right, um, Commissioner Maxfield? Well, I stepped down for uh, term limits. No, I'm talking about Chip Maxfield. And he Chip stepped did, down yeah. for family reasons. Yeah. 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 And uh, but the term limits did me a favor. I was. Kind of burned out, ready, you know, to, mm -hmm. to move on. That's a long time. So it wasn't as partisan in those days. And uh, there were factions from time to time. And But I felt I could get along with all of them. I wasn't on the any, any feud or wasn't considered part of any faction at any point. And seven person commission, you got to count to four. And it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, you need to make sure that you can try to find common ground with people on issues that shouldn't have much to do with political ideology on local government. Well, I mean, that, that was kind of my follow-up question for you is, like, why is everything so, why, why has everything got to be a Democrat or Republican issue anymore? I mean, and now I don't know on the county commission level if you had to deal with this, but, like, I don't care if I'm a Democrat or Republican, like, 
if the street that I'm driving on to get to work is screwed up and there's potholes everywhere and all this mess going on, like, yeah. is that a Democrat issue? Is that a Republican issue? issue? I mean, like, for me, it's like, hey, can we just get somebody to fix this? That's right. Should it be a nonpartisan seat? It should be a nonpartisan office. All county, county elected office, it should be nonpartisan. They made... They switched it finally, made sheriff nonpartisan. I think they've made the constables now nonpartisan. But should the DA be partisan? Why should county commissioners be partisan or the county treasurer? Uh, w w Wolfson locks up all Republicans anyway, so. It's, <laughs> it's just a remnant of the old, <laughs> I tried to get it changed, but the rural representatives wanted to make sure that Republicans could get elected in those counties. And the Democrats wanted to make sure that Democrats would get elected in Clark County. Right. And that's basically, you put your name on the ballot, Democrats in local government are gonna get elected in Clark County. Republicans are getting elected in Lyon County. Right. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's uh, an excuse for thinking and analyzing and finding out what, who these people are and what they stand for. So I guess my next question would be then, so how did the, um, if you can, uh, as briefly as possible, so how did the 215 come about? Like, how did that work? I've, I've heard so many different stories about how it was a partnership between state, federal, and like, how, how, how did that, how did that come yeah. about? Because I mean, that's, a, that's something that's very significant in my life without the 215. Driving to work would, sorry, it would suck. All right, I, uh, I. It used to suck. Yeah. <laughs> I became a commissioner in 1981. I became a member of the Regional Transportation Commission in the mid. How old 80s. were you when you became commissioner, by the way? I was 36. Okay. And I became a commissioner. How old is um, McGregory, the one that just became commissioner? I don't know. He looks, he looks young, like yeah. he's in his 20s or something. Um. I don't, I don't know. I'm just wondering. But, uh, <laughs> so I became acutely aware. They made me chairman of the Regional Transportation Commission and, I, uh, and chairman of the Regional Flood Control District. I became acutely aware that our community was really growing like crazy. And we had a freeway system that was, um, could accommodate a population of about 250,000. We were already past that. And growing very, very fast. And so, and we had very limited resources. Local government had four cents of gasoline tax for those purposes. And we were getting an unfair share of the state and federal dollars, most of which were going north. So I just, I um, announced that we needed to prepare a master transportation plan for Clark County made up of freeways, new freeways, uh, improvements to the arterial road system, and a new mass transit system. And we needed to go to the voters. And so I had the county and the RTC help me prepare the plans, and I got business and labor and community groups together to support the ballot question, where we got the people of the community to agree to new revenue sources, and a central feature of the plan was a new beltway around the community. It was controversial as to where you would put it. Everybody wanted it to be close enough for good access, but not so close that it would disrupt their neighborhood. So we had many uh, interesting debate. It's funny you say that now. Neighborhoods are being built around it. <laughs> yes. And the sound walls and... I mean, neighbors are being built everywhere, but we were able to get the public to approve it. Um, I led the way on that, and um, so little by little, that was the only freeway in the United States being built primarily or almost always all with local funds, no federal funds, until we then went to the federal government and became eligible to get federal money for the interchanges. Oh, okay. And so it's several interchanges, freeway to freeway, and some major roads into the 215. And most of those have now been 
built with federal money. Yeah. But the main beltway, hundreds of millions of dollars, is with this new local money that I helped to obtain from the citizens. There are things like the Desert Inn Super Arterial also. Right. All of the uh, pedestrian bridges across the Strip, a new bus system. We had a very inadequate, almost non-existent uh, mass transit system before that. And so that's kind of how it came about. Well, you know, and and I'm I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you uh, responded to that because, you know, and speaking with people all the time, they go, "Well, I don't understand how you can be a Republican." And like we go back and forth, and I, I go, "Well, I don't understand how you can be a Democrat." And we kind of argue back and forth, whatever. But I said, so I've been asked several times, like, so what's your uh, What's your stance, uh, Jim, on what the role of government is? And I said, well, here's what I want the government to do. Two main things. I said, number one, I need a road to get to work. Number two, when I finally fall asleep at night, I don't want a bomb dropping on my head. There you go. As far as long as I have a road to get to work and I don't have to worry about my house getting blown up, I'll take care of the rest of myself. Yeah, I think the, the main purpose of local government is, yeah, as you say, a road to drive in, public works in general, yeah. roads, flood control, um, water systems and uh, sewage systems, and the basic hardware of, of the community. Second, public safety, police, fire, ambulance. And uh, that's, those are the main functions. That's what we should give primary focus too. Um, we have a lot of federal mandates on local government that you have to respond to. Right. Um, a lot of which, you know, I mean, we, people can debate whether they're worthwhile or not, but those are the main functions of, of local government as I see it. So Commissioner, what do you think about block grants? Because I'm actually, I'm actually one of those people that I, I actually believe heavily in block grants. I think that, okay, so the state of Nevada pays this much to the federal government, and then the federal government gives X amount of dollars back to the state, yeah. and then the state can disperse it the way it sees fit. Well, yes, there are block grants, and we uh, community development block grants. The county commission makes the decision on who gets gets those. Others are decided by, by the state and by the cities within their jurisdictions. And uh, there can be abuses of block grants, uh, favoritism and so on, but generally they're, they're rather worthwhile. I think most of those that I've seen over the years. So not to keep taking up so much time, but I got, I got one, one, one last uh, major question to ask you. So first off, I wanna thank you for um, flood control. Because I think anybody who has been in this town for any period of time. So I moved here in 1986. And a, a very close area of where I actually live now, it was a little further away when I first moved here. But those of you who have lived in Las Vegas, say prior to like, I wanna say 1995, remembers the nightmares of when it would rain here. Mm -hmm. The Charleston the Charleston underpass is, is, a, is a main one. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, I remember when um, you guys were uh, working on flood control, there was a lot of pushback on that. Like, oh, it's a desert, who cares? Like, it, it's, right. it's not that big of a deal. But if people that lived here for a long period of time realize what it was like when it would be sunny here in the middle of the valley and it'd be pouring down rain on the mountains and, and the next thing water. you know everything is flooded like you remember yes. i'm sure you remember the imperial palace nightmare many many times yeah yeah so yeah. how did how were you able to get how were you able to get people convinced to be able to spend money on that yeah well first of all a little history when i grew up here in las vegas Lived in what was called the Hunt Ridge neighborhood in John S. Park, yeah, right. historic area, and uh, it would flood 
and we love that we get a you know and a piece of uh, wood and sail down the street you know <laughs> on on the channel it was and this Charleston underpass <laughs> would totally fill up and that was about the only way you can get from one side of town to the other in those days yeah. and you couldn't do it but anyway um, after I became a commissioner in 1981 there was massive floods in the early 80s into the mid 80s um, I went to the state legislature 1983 to try to get a flood control district created we were not successful more flooding in 1984 and then the 1985 legislature agreed to create a flood control district where the membership of the of the board was the same as the established regional transportation commission but a different board different function and uh, they gave us the authority to get a vote of the people for a quarter cent sales tax so i was uh, elected as the first chairman of the flood control district and was kind of called the father of flood control i think it's now it's probably the grandfather or great-grandfather of flood control but uh, we took our first general manager was virginia valentine who's now the ceo of the nevada resort association she was 28 years old engineer she was she was the county manager at one particular and she time. became a county manager later but she and some citizens and i went out into the community i think we made literally hundreds of presentations wherever two or more were gathered we were there and um rotary clubs and hound board or other citizen groups unions and and we raised money like you'd raise money for any political campaign and yeah and did a, a media campaign and convinced the citizens to pass that quarter cent tax and to fund the flood control measures that have resulted in you know uh, detention basins and flood channels and a lot of improvement yeah and so i mean uh, no other questions for you just other than the fact that um I'm very, I, I, and I mean this wholeheartedly, it, it is an absolute privilege to sit next to you because I, um, I, I, I think you're a, a, the perfect example of how government can work for the people instead of against the people. Like, for instance, like, I'm pretty much one of those guys that like, oh, raise taxes oh hell no I, I, I'm not paying more in taxes whatever Good. but when you approach people like that and it actually is done a lot of good uh, you know flood control like you can drive across town now when it pours down rain in this town you years ago you couldn't do that um, the 215 is a perfect example and um, so I like how you've been able to prove to people that like, yeah, if you do pay a little bit more here or there, then something actually good can come of it. And yes. uh, I, I really honestly wish you would mentor some of your uh, yeah. colleagues that are on the county commission now, because I, I, I think they could learn a lesson or two from you. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And I, I also sponsored what was called the County Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Because I like you, I, I don't want to raise anybody's taxes, especially my own. But uh, in which it said, in essence, there will be no increase in county property taxes or any other tax without a vote of the people. And I don't know if they've held on to that in recent years, but if the people want, are agreeable to tax themselves, first of all, it has to be limited, it has to be targeted. Right. You have to tell them exactly what they're going to get and when they're going to get it. And they have to be able to trust you that that's going to take place. Right. Otherwise... Like the marijuana tax. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's supposed to pay for education. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so that, there's um, skepticism and it's understandable at times, for sure. How, how come you never ran for anything else? I was, I was asked and urged to many, many times uh, to run for Attorney General and Congress. 
which I think is the worst job anybody could have from a Western state. You're raising yeah, money flying every and day, forth. flying yeah. back. You imagine forth. the people in American Samoa, um, yes. uh, Congresswoman Amata Amaya. Yeah. Right. By the way, I represent some wonderful Samoan people right now whose young man was killed in a short-term rental party. You know, you see these out of, anyway, wonderful people. Um, but uh, anyway, that's what has to happen and to make people believe in you. Steve, you can jump in any time. You know. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, yeah, sorry, I was, I, was, I was actually going to pass over. Steve, he's, believe it or not, we're not twins. <laughs> he's six years younger yeah, than me, I'm, so. I'm the younger one. Yeah. Kind of looking to, but, uh, <laughs> so my thing is uh, going forward with one, um, two, two parts, the, the monorail. How viable do you think it is to uh, get that all the way to McCarran? Um, it's viable now. You know, the monorail is has been sold to the convention authority now because uh, with the COVID shutdown of the hotels, the monorail had to shut down. Ran out of money. No way to no way to get it really started again. And it had trouble from the very beginning. It had trouble, but. Only in the sense that it could not pay back the initial construction bonds. Yeah, these big boys and girls who decided it was a good investment, it turned out that it paid for itself on an ongoing operating basis. There's no other mass transit system in the United States that is not subsidized on the operate for its operating expenses. The monorail was not subsidized only for the initial startup cost, which in the case of most, if not all, other mass transit systems are subsidized by tax money. But uh, it couldn't go to the airport and in past because it was only on one side of the strip. And you would get such fierce opposition from the resorts on the other side of the strip if you're going to the airport and they're not being served by it. And so, uh, but now the convention authority can probably make it happen, but they're, they're tying it in with the underground system. Right, yeah, that, that was the other thing I wanted yeah. to ask you about. So are you, uh, are you in favor of the Boring Company doing what they're doing? And do you think that can be a long-term solution? Yeah, or? I am. Um, as long as they, they should recognize the value, though, of the monorail system and link these together. Right. And, and uh, I've always been in favor of any additional options for our citizens and our visitors for transportation. Um, I guess we almost yearn for those days when you have gridlock on the strip, which we don't now because of what's going on, but hopefully we get back to that and we're going to need all the transportation options that we can get. Right, yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln the two is important. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm real interested because I'm a Elon Musk. Um, I yeah. guess you could call me like a is fan. It, isn't boy. he building some underground railroad? That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what, what we're talking, talking about. about. Oh. So it's called the Boring Company. The Boring Company. They're already doing it at the convention center. Now they're moving out into the community. And they're supposed to have high speed rail um, from California. In California. To California. Different company. Um, isn't it the, the folks who've taken over the. Uh, uh, resorts. I can't remember. I, I, I can't either. I'm not. I honestly think that uh, this is kind of conspiracy level. I think that's just a, a project that'll never happen. And these surveys and uh, uh, man, I can't even think. Environmental impact studies and all that stuff. Kind of. I kind of lean in towards that's just money going to someone's pocket. Maybe. And for it to be worthwhile, California is going to have to come through on their part of the high speed rail, and, they, and the price tag keeps going up and up and up. Yeah, when I, I spent a couple of years living in California, and they want uh, their own high speed rail in state going from LA to uh, Northern California. Yeah. So I think that would be, they would want that more than so much the Vegas thing because of the business yeah. leaving California. The one for Vegas is supposed to go to Victorville, which will make sense only if the California link comes to Victorville or Palmdale and, and put them together. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was all I had. Is it? Yeah. 
This guy's just been on the county commission 28 no. years. I know, but you guys, <laughs> you guys are good for those questions. I was just wondering about going forward with your past, yeah. past experience. It's fun well. to talk about those things. So, so what, what boards did you, um, I, I know you were talking about a little bit about the boards you were on. Could, could you, could you yeah, the, reiterate? Uh, not only when you're a county commissioner or a city councilman or councilwoman, you uh, not only serve on the, the main board, but members are appointed to various regional boards that are very important. Um, I served on the Las Vegas Visitors and Convention Authority for a while. And, but then I tra more or less traded my spot there to get on the Regional Transportation Commission because I thought that was so much more important to my constituents. And so Manny Cortez and I Oh, I said, Manny, I, you want to be on the convention authority? I want to be on the RTC, which became the Flood Control District Board also. Yeah. And then I was the first chairman of the uh, County Air Quality Board and proposed a Clean Air Action Plan that was business friendly and did a good job in helping to clear up the, the air in the, in the community. Uh, I was for a while on the uh, Board of Health. Gosh, I think I was probably every board that there is at one time or another. UMC is still a county hospital, right? It's a county hospital, and I, of course, was on the board of UMC. Uh, toward the end of my tenure, we created a, a special um, board for UMC. The county commissioners still oversee it, but they have kind of an operating board of appointed um, officials on for the everyday operations. What about the fiscal affairs? You've ever sat on that one? Fiscal affairs, uh, for the, that's for the, the um, Metro Police Department. The Police Department. I never served on that board, no. Why? Why not? Because <laughs> uh, there's only so many hours in a day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good answer. But I figured after 28 years, you probably would have just yeah. had so, at some point that served on the fiscal <laughs> So I do have I, I do have another question. This is a, this is a, a political question. So, so we, we've had these discussions, and and you had brought it up too, and like, and I've heard this in all my different discussions that I've had over the years. So the county, so you're saying the county commission should be a nonpartisan seat. I think so. But let's be honest, just like judges, right? So they're supposedly nonpartisan. Like everything is partisan now. So what good would it be to say that the county commission is a nonpartisan seat? Like wh who does that really benefit when we really truly understand that that person's a Republican or a Democrat? Well, well it's just like the city council, I mean, which is nonpartisan. Well, it, well same and, thing. And, and That's it opens what I mean. up the door for everybody to vote. Yeah. You know, for that person in the, in the primary. Some, some people will look up and, and, and care what your partisan affiliation is if it's a nonpartisan board. Uh, but most people wouldn't. For example, in the city of Boulder City, uh, city council, it's nonpartisan. Yeah. Boulder City is overwhelmingly Republican in registration. All but one of the members of the city council in Boulder City now are Democrats. Yeah. Elected by this Republican electorate because they, most people don't care yeah. Unless, unless you, you put it in front of their face, uh, I'm going to vote for the Republican. Uh, more good people could get elected okay. yeah. than now. Um, because then that, I see what you're saying, Steve. So then that eliminates the primary part of it, too. Uh, Commissioner, okay. why, why don't you lobby for that? I why did. You, you did? Uh, Two sessions ago, uh, it was a three, I did, and we had a bill that was moving forward, and the Republicans had a majority then in at least one of the houses in the... Is that when Sandoval was in office? He was in office. So that would have been my daughter, 2016. My daughter, Melissa, was a state assemblywoman there, and an assemblyman named Steve Silberkraus Silber sponsored the bill, okay. and it was making progress, but as I say, the Democrats in Clark County didn't want it because 
the way it is now. A Democrat gets automatically elected. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. And the Republicans in the rural counties didn't want it because the Republicans get automatically automatically elected. And so good people don't get elected just because of their affiliation. That's pissing off Stavros Anthony right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He lost by 15 votes. If Stavros (laughs) in that race had been nonpartisan, who knows? Who knows? I think he I would have may most likely been elected. Well, why don't you try it again, Commissioner? It's a it's a different it's a different um, legislative board out there. I yeah I have a son-in-law who's up there now, and I, I'm uh, certainly open to it because I think it should be done. Yeah, because I mean I I really truly believe this that like and I talk with like far leaning left far leaning right I, I i talk to all of them and there's there is a real honest like a surgence in this country right now for nonpartisan or independents i think so now i mean obviously we haven't seen a third party really actually catch traction yet but as far as like independent thinkers and stuff i mean we're we're getting to that threshold now i believe Commissioner, what, what, what advice would you give this new um, Board of County Commissioners that was just recently um, sworn into office? Well, um, nobody's calling me and asking me for advice. But, um, that's not quite true. I, I do have some people on the board that I, I talk to now and then. Um, I would say avoid factionalism. You, you're all of one party, so party factions isn't a factor, but during the last how many years, 10 years since I left the county commission, um, there have been fierce factions. The current governor was, had four, including himself, commissioners that were against the other three on almost everything. It was not healthy for good government, and please try to avoid that try to work with each other in, in, in a, a collaborative way, try to find common ground. Um, no, not everybody's gonna love each other, um, but you can sure try to work with each other. Mm. And, uh, for the good of the people, right? For the good of the people. And it, it, it doesn't have to even be said, but don't let yourself be captured by special interests. Um, in other words, there have been commissioners who have gone to jail, who like to hang out with, you know, uh, fat cats and big shots, and you can be taken in and be corrupted if you allow that to happen. Stay as a man or a woman of the people. Did uh, Steve Sisolak, Larry Brown, um, Chris June Kiliani, Lawrence Weekly, yeah. did, w- which have now passed from the board, mm-hmm. did any one of them ever reach out to you and said, hey, you know, how would you do this? Just give me some advice. Commissioner Bruce Woodbury would... No, not really. Um, really? I mean, after 28 years on the county commission, you, you think somebody that's on the commission well, would reach out like to you. Mary Beth Scow did, and Jim Gibson has. And Jim Gibson just, just recently came to the board. Yeah. He was appointed and then, then elected. Yeah. He's, he's a good guy, and he's, I'd say, a moderate Democrat. You know? Right. And a moderate person by personality and right, right. temperament. And right. Good person. Yeah. So just those two? Oh, that's come to mind, but there's probably been others. But nobody's... Uh, the RTC and the state transportation... Um, Department have, have both hired me as consultant from on a couple of occasions, okay. and I worked with uh, elected representatives there, and they asked for my advice. That's basically the the extent of it. Yeah. Well, I hope they would, since Doggone Freeway is named after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what goes up can come down too, you know. If I, it's funny. I drive on the two fifteen from time to time, and I'll drive by one of those signs and. This sounds phony, but it still surprises me whenever I see it. And right. I say, oh my gosh. 
will I be worthy of that? You know. So. I'd like to get a freeway named after me someday. <laughs> But I want to be alive to see it as well because you know everybody they're dead and all of a sudden they get a building name after them, no, there's a street name. A lot of people in the community, I'm sure, especially new ones, who say, "Who the heck is Bruce Woodbury?" Anyway, you know. Yeah. Well, well, Commissioner Woodbury, could, it's it's an abs absolute honor to have you on the program, and and I don't know why we haven't done this earlier, why we haven't done it while you were a county commissioner. <laughs> yeah. This is the first time you've been on the show, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I don't know, what, what were we thinking, Jim? I don't know. What have you been thinking? No, I don't. <laughs> I haven't been hiding out, have I? I hope no, I have. No, you haven't been hiding out. No, it's been a pleasure. You guys are great gentlemen, and I, it's an honor to, to be here with you. Commissioner Woodbury, could you look into the camera and, and just reach out to people and maybe, maybe have some kind of solidarity or something? And, and if you want to give your point of contact, you're more than welcome to do so. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, it, I, all I can say it was a an unbelievable honor and a privilege to have represented you in local government for all those many years. Um, I'll never be able to uh, repay that, that debt. I can only hope that my tenure in office was worthy of the support I had and um, from so many of you. I don't miss, I think, the, uh, the politics of it and hidden agendas and so on that sometimes you find on boards and governments, but I do miss the opportunity to interact on a, a regular basis with so many good people, my constituents and interested citizens at our meetings and out in the neighborhoods. And so um, thanks for putting up with me. And uh, I just ask God's blessings upon the wonderful people of this community. Thank you. Before we let you go, Commissioner Woodbury, did you get along with Tom Collins? <laughs> yes and no. For the most part I did until I left the commission. And then there was an issue that came up where I was asking, uh, I was on the board of the Boulder City Hospital and we were in line for, for a grant, a community block grant. Yeah. And he went into a tirade, including me, about me, that, sorry, Tom, <laughs> um, because he had something else in mind for that money, I guess. I didn't even know. Yeah. But I want to thank Tom. He gave me this wonderful jacket for the National Finals Rodeo. Oh. He's always a cowboy. He's a cowboy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. And Tom's a good guy, and I hope he's doing well. Again, Commissioner Woodbury, thank you so much for being on the program. Folks, that's former Clark County Commissioner Bruce Woodbury. Um, he's an icon. He's a legend. He's been in this community since the day he was born. Got a freeway named after him. <laughs> and I mean, he, I mean, he served on the board of county commissioner for 28 years, and he's been on many boards since. Um, anybody that doesn't know Bruce Woodbury, you haven't been in this town too long. But um, um, I'd like to thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, my pleasure. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas, and Steve Jonas with Veterans in Politics. Until next time.